So Mark Elder, please could you explain how you first discovered Strauss opera as, as a listener? It was one of the most incredible moments of my life um, because it wasn't just as a listener, it was as a player. And before I went to Cambridge, and I knew nothing about anything at all, my mother got a little phone message which says, uh, would Mark like to play in Ariadne auf Naxos by Strauss? And I hadn't got up to Cambridge and I was very, very young and I had no idea what Naxos was, what Alf meant or who Ariadne was. And I thought Strauss wrote waltzes. So uh, it was an incredible moment for me because to play in this music when you don't know what's coming around the next corner is an incredible uh, opportunity for one's ears, for your heart. And I played the bassoon and we, we did this Ariadne in Cambridge when I was very young. And the hairs stood up on the back of my neck for two weeks. It was a wonderful experience, I've never forgotten it. It really launched me into opera. And how about um, the first time you conducted, uh, I won't say Strauss in general, St uh, Strauss opera? Well, I think the first time I conducted an opera by Strauss was Der Rosenkavalier. And I worked on it when I joined English National Opera at the beginning of the 70s. And my great friend and colleague, Sir Charles McCarris, was conducting it. And I assisted him and I took it over, as often is the case. It's a very good way to train young conductors, is just to throw them in. So that's what he did to me. And I later did my own performances. But it was a piece by then that I knew very well because I'd worked on it in Australia, funnily enough, and at Covent Garden when I was on the music staff there, so I knew how it went. And that's one of the great qualities about a Strauss opera, is it's a great machine. What the orchestra does and what the singers have to do with the orchestra is extremely elaborate, ornamented, as it were. And you need to know how this machine rumbles on. And uh, I shall never forget conducting Rosen Cavalier for the first time. It was incredibly exciting because it has music of great beauty in it and music of great virtuosity. Not all the music in Rosen Cavalier is of, is of the first quality in my view, but the best bits are some of the most beautiful things he ever wrote. How do you know that you're conducting a Strauss opera? I know when I'm conducting a Strauss opera because the beauty of writing for the voices in the orchestra is like no one else's beauty that what the orchestra have to play is so subtly following the details of the conversations and the dreaming of the singers that it's such fun to rehearse and conduct. And with Strauss, as opposed to any other composer, the easy, uninhibited flow of the music is something that you have to train an orchestra to feel. And that is very rewarding not to get too bogged down in the, in the little details, let the orchestra sort it out, but to flow so the music is never impeded. And to discipline the singers and the orchestra to obey all the instructions that Strauss so cleverly has put. And the sensuality of the score, whichever opera you're talking about, is so overwhelming that it's easy to get lost in it and enjoy yourself too much. And we all have something to learn from Strauss himself, who, when we see him conduct, conducted in a very offhand manner, almost bored. And I think those famous TV shots of Strauss conducting his own music was trying to send out a message. Everything is there. It's all written down. The conductor just needs to control the pulse of the music and make sure that everybody is absolutely on the ball. It doesn't need great sweating, throwing yourself around. It needs control and everything then will come good. And that's the secret, I think, of, of conducting Strauss. And when you're conducting Strauss, do you uh, religiously follow his example? I try. I'm a very different person from Strauss and I do break sweat just occasionally uh, because the music is very energetic. But his music is so complicated and can be so overwhelming for the singers that it needs such control. And if a conductor is too wild, 
the orchestra cannot play quietly enough. So in Strauss mood, it means calm, inner calm, and delight in his skill. Strauss wrote his operas following on from the traditions of the way music had developed in Germany through the 19th century. But he had an incredibly fecund imagination. And the first thing about a Strauss opera is that there is an enormous number of notes. Not always notes that need to be heard, but everybody has the most extraordinary part to play because he was a wonderful writer for orchestra. And I think it's worth remembering that by the time he wrote his first opera, he was already extremely famous as a modern composer, a new composer. And he'd written very, very famous pieces for the orchestra. Alsace Brack Zarathustra, Don Juan, Ein Heldenleben, these huge, complicated, but very moving, very impressive symphonic poems written for large orchestras had made his reputation. When he took that skill in writing for the orchestra, and by then he could make an orchestra sound like anything. He said, I think I, think I could now make an orchestra sound like a knife, spoon and fork. <laughs> um, he'd made them sound incredible. He had such an imagination. When he went into the theatre to write operas, he was really ready to make his oral imagination uh, the most predominant thing. And that's the problem with the Strauss opera, is that the orchestra is so active, so descriptive, in tiny details, they'll just do an eyebrow or a smile. And the music cascades forward, usually in a fast flowing tempo, that you have to be very careful that you're not too loud. And the orchestra have to know the music well enough to play it delicately. And where do the singers uh, fit in in that, uh, in that um, picture you've painted? The singers are trying to articulate a play, because all Strauss's libretti have a fast interaction between the characters, almost all of them, conversation pieces that he has coloured and described with the orchestra. So their role is to speak very clearly, to be able to give lots of different colours with their voices, and then suddenly to make the most beautiful line and then the sensuality of his operas, which is the other quality, conversation, sensuality, kicks in. And his love, particularly of the female voice, plays a big, big part. Does that come from uh, the fact that he was married to a soprano? Or is there more to it than that? I'm not sure of the right answer to that, but I suspect he was married to a soprano because he loved the human voice. He fell in love with her very curmudgeonly personality. He fell in love with her artistry. She was a wonderful singer, not with the most beautiful voice, but she had the most wonderful ability to project and to play character. And he wrote lots of songs for her. He knew her voice incredibly well. And I think he learnt working in the theatre how the voice functions, how a particular technique will give you a particular quality in the singing role, uh, an elevated, sensual, very womanly sound world. And he often loved to combine more than one female voice. One of his operas, Arabella, for instance, has a role for a younger sister who has to be as a boy in society because the parents have no money. And so they don't want to appear to be trying to marry off two daughters. So they make the younger one a tomboy. But still Strauss gives them the most glorious music to sing as two sisters and their voices combine and mix and float upwards and downwards in the most enjoyable and uh, sensual way. Does he place um, uh, extra intense demands on the female voice? Did he push the female voice further than it, than it had been before in the repertoire? Well of course his immediate predecessor in that particular role was, was Richard Wagner and in Wagner's operas the female voice is expected to have stamina and power and poetry. That was quite remarkable for the late 19th century. I'm thinking of roles like Brunhilde in The Ring, the great heroine, Isolde in his love opera Tristan and Isolde, 
Even center, his early opera in The Dutchman, The Flying Dutchman, is a role that needs great strength. So Strauss, as a younger man, was looking to keep that going. And he became fascinated by certain topics, by certain uh, plays that might be turned into an opera. His first opera, in which his wife sang the female part, was not so greatly successful. It's rather heavy going and German in the worst way, although it's got beautiful music in it. Um, but his third opera was Salome, and his fourth was Electra. And these were both one-act operas, both lasting about an hour and 40, 45 minutes, with the title part, a soprano. And there, Strauss took the soprano voice and made it do things of such mercurial beauty. Made them, made them act with their voice in the most arresting and dramatic way. Of course, they're very two, two very different ladies. Salome is supposed to be an adolescent girl, but if you cast an adolescent girl, she wouldn't get past the first 20 pages of the score. Um, you need to have great stamina and strength in your vocal cords, but to be able to play this child, this kitten, um, this rather self-centered girl who demands and demands and demands until she's given what she wants, the head of the baritone on a plate. In Electra, it's a revenge tragedy, isn't it? And Electra is hardly off the stage the whole time. And there, the orchestral weight, because of the nature of the text, the nature of the story, the orchestra sounds completely different from the way it does in the more um, opulent and uh, shadowy and glittering world of Salome in the Middle East. Electra is more gutsy, more psychologically distraught, and as a woman and as music. And so what he made the soprano voice do in Electra is the biggest role he ever wrote. He took the female voice and stretched it to its limit and again, the challenge for the conductor is to make the quiet music quiet enough so that Electra doesn't have to shout all night long. It's so important that she is able to sing within herself. And that depends on the orchestra being in perfect balance with the voices. But it's very challenging. Those two operas um, consist of this raging, dissonant turmoil. They, they're, they're operas of, that contain violent passions. Um, where, did they, where did that music come from? The music of Salome and Electra is, as I've said, rather different. But their originality comes from Strauss's genius. There's nothing in music before them that would have led one to expect this music to come. And I say that despite the fact that the influence that Tristan and Parsifal had on succeeding generations of composers was, of course, immense. Because in that music, Wagner took harmony and tonality right to the border. Nobody could believe it was possible to write music more complicated than Tristan. And the beauty of the harmony in Parsifal had an enormous influence. But I think Strauss, by the time he, he started to write operas, knew where he was going. He knew that he could trust his own musical imagination to the extent that something would come that would fit the words. And in Electra, the psychology of the situation is so extraordinary with this very difficult relationship with Clytemnestra, her mother and her sister, very neurotic. Her mother worried by dreams, marvellous music portraying her neurosis and her nightmares and her worry and her insecurity about what she's done and what will happen in the future. It's very, very, very well done by Strauss. And the colour that the orchestra has was something totally from him. They're very different, aren't they, from uh, De Rosenkavalier. De Rosenkavalier was, was the opera which he, he mentioned when, um, uh, in 1945, the American forces got as far as Garmisch. He said, I am Richard Strauss, the composer of De Rosenkavalier. Why is it that that is the opera which, uh, which is remembered above all? De Rosenkavalier has a very human situation at its heart. 
it has fun, it has melancholy, it has escapades, and the most glorious final 15 minutes, where these three female voices, one of whom is playing the part of a young man, try to sort out the emotional turmoil of the opera and come to some resolution. The central character, not the title part, the central character is a general's wife, Feldmarschall's wife, the Marshaline. And she's not an old woman at all, but she amuses herself in her husband's long absences with an affair with a young man who she knows instinctively will find somebody his age sooner or later. And that's what happens. I think Rosencavalier is in a world of an old Vienna, set in a world of old Vienna, where there is great brilliance and charm, where the waltz is just round the corner, rather ahead of its time, of course. Uh, the waltz came later. But Strauss's music is so colourful, so racy, so descriptive, right from the opening pages, descriptive of their lovemaking, that it easily won itself a very, very large, enduring audience. And the appeal of Der Rosenkavler is not just for the female voices. There's the most wonderful comic bass role that many basses adore to do. You need to have a very low bottom C and a very high note as well at the top. It's a great comic virtuoso part. And many artists have had great association with that. So there's plenty for the ear and plenty for the eye in Rosenkavler. And there is a simplicity in some of the music, the waltzes and the delicate conversation scenes that of course is very, very attractive. In addition to that, throughout quite a long opera in three acts, there are milestones of beauty. There are famous bits. When the Martian is left alone in the first act, she sings a monologue about getting old and about her past and what on earth is it all about. Um, in the second act, when the male lead meets the young girl, the presentation of the rose is the most lovely duet between these two female voices. And so it goes on. There are moments of beauty and special musical quality throughout the evening. And I think this means that it is his most popular opera, but it's by no means his best. What is it about um, the attraction of having female voices sing male roles in Strauss? You know, uh, Der Rosenkavalier is by no means the only instance in which it happens. The attraction uh, was, of course, reaching back into an, a long tradition. And the idea that a young man could be perfectly well portrayed by a young girl is not so strange when it's well done. Mozart had done it, of course, in The Marriage of Figaro, the role of Cherubino, the adolescent, sex-obsessed um, young man. Uh, you can in a young boy, as it were, someone who hasn't quite reached manhood, see a female quality, the androgynous quality, uh, all the time in life. And it needs a particularly imaginative artist to do it well. And Strauss was following on from that tradition, a tradition that had been kept through the 19th century in Italy as well. Not to everybody's satisfaction, it depended so much on the quality of the artist. But for Strauss, I think he grasped at it as a way to allow the sound of the female voices to mingle together and soar over the orchestra. And this is something that he did supremely well. And there was a sort of bond between the two voices, and in Rosenkavalier's situation, eventually three, that was very, very exciting for the audience. And it allowed him to make the orchestra very rich and then over the top would, would come these waves of sound, so beautiful. And I think he allowed himself to create these trouser rolls, as we call them, with great pleasure. If we could move on to the, the last operas, which some of which are less well known than the ones we've been talking about. Um, his, his, the final years of his career as an opera composer were played out as uh, there were great historic changes in Germany. Is it possible to summarise the direction in which those operas uh, travelled? Yes, it is. Some of the stories are rather elaborate 
and not so clear and some of the music is of, the, of not of the best quality. And it's rare in the, the operas at the end of his life to find one piece that has that sense of integrity, that wholeness, that I think characterizes Salome and Electra. And of course, for so much of the early part of his operatic career, he'd had this unusual and very well documented relationship with Hugo von Hofmannsthal, the great poet and theatrical manipulator. And they, their relationship is well documented because they didn't meet very often. And so the letters are an extraordinary testament to this co collaborative relationship. But he died while they were working on Arabella, a very beautiful opera, in my view, that, that needed Hofmannsthal's uh, skill to finish it and make it really, really perfect. And after that, he, was, of course, was hard put to it to find somebody as clever and somebody to balance him. And the weaknesses in the later operas, in my view, stem perhaps from that more than from anything else. But also, as time went by, after the First War, into the 20s and then the 30s, Strauss was pushing his musical style into something more and more abstruse harmonically. The music is, is more involved than you can imagine. Uh, but the harmony changes very quickly and it's very hard to keep track with it as it is so possible in Rosencavalier and Ariadne, for instance. And the pieces aren't quite so successful. There are exceptions. The very final opera, Capriccio, is a lovely conversation piece about the, the relationship between words and music in opera. And it has some fantastically beautiful music in it, particularly the end, his farewell to the operatic stage. And before that, there was a domestic comedy, Intermezzo, with some more autobiographical qualities to it, that, again, has good moments and good scenes, but as a whole isn't quite as satisfactory uh, as some of the earlier operas. And I think um, Strauss's reputation, of course, by then was enormous, and he was very successful and very rightly uh, honoured and respected. But it is really in the in the operas of the early part and the middle part. And for my money, the most beautiful music that he wrote for the opera stage is to be found in Die Frau ohne Schatten. So that begs the question, what is the greatest Strauss opera and why? Well, I love Die Frau ohne Schatten. It's a fairy tale atmosphere and the music has extraordinary quality not just beauty, but fantasy and magic and supernatural colours, both bright and dark. Uh, it's a long opera. The libretto is hard to understand. It's convoluted a little bit too much. But I think its beauties are more beautiful than anything else that he wrote. There are scenes in it of such originality. Not a sentimental beauty, you understand, but an originality of colour the way he uses the orchestra. There are scenes in the second act, it's three long acts, but very worthwhile. There are scenes in the second act of really haunting originality and the sounds that he creates. And it's a, it's a text that has to do with dreams, fantasies, desires, yearning, um, to do with different worlds, the high spirit world, the low, almost subhuman world something between the two and he copes with that with the hand of a master and I think it's his greatest achievement despite the fact that not all of it is of the very highest quality but then perhaps that's true of all Strauss's operas you could say that the dance of the seven veils in Salome for instance is is a slight weakness in, in, it's, it's theatrically effective, but as music, it's not so extraordinary as the rest of the opera. Um, Electra has the greatest consistency of musical and dramatic control, uh, and I adore it and respect it. But there's something about Frau Neuschatten that I think is, is very special. No one else has quite achieved that in that way. And I long to see a production that 
lives up to what I have in my fantasy. So that, in your view, is the greatest opera, but if you were to find yourself cast, for example, on a, on a desert island, you were told you can take only one Strauss opera with you, would it be that or would it be something else? If the circumstances of continued listening were to be in such a remote place as a desert island, I would take Ariadne because she's on a desert island. It's the first piece of Strauss's that I knew intimately. And my love of it, of little details, the broad sweep of it, is immense. And it is very nearly perfect. And particularly in its second version with its wonderful prologue. There is so much to enjoy. Uh, his skill in timing, in the theatrical effects that he has to find music for in both the prologue and the main part of the opera are so lovely and delicious and it has no bombast in it at all. So I think I would take Ariadne to the desert island and hope that somebody would come and rescue me as somebody nearly does with her. Final question. Um, if by some strange quirk of history you managed to find yourself in the room with uh, Richard Strauss and you were able to put a question to him, something that might um, just, uh, you know, um, clear up a query that you might have had over the years. Mm. What might that question be? I would probably say, Herr Doctor, uh, was it really true that you didn't want to hear all the notes that you'd written? Wouldn't you prefer to hear all your notes? So Mark Elder, on behalf of the Katie Wong Foundation, thank you very much indeed.